Welcome to the Greater Montana Foundation Legacy Project, preserving the history of Montana broadcasting and the pioneers of communication whose vision and foresight brought together the people of Montana. Hello, I'm Norma Ashby, part of the Greater Montana Foundation Legacy Project. We're so honored to be able to interview some of our great broadcasters who have been in Montana doing great work in our field for many years, and today's guest is no exception. He is Dave Wilson, who has been on the radio since 1969, and in addition to that, he has allowed his beautiful voice to be heard on many radio and television commercials. So, Dave, welcome. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you very much, Norma. <laughs> we're going to start at the beginning and find out a little bit about your background, where you were born and raised, and a little bit about your education. All right. I was actually uh, delivered by a midwife uh, out in the country about 12 miles south of Hamilton, Alabama, uh -huh. uh, 1940. And... Uh, uh, then grew up uh, basically there and uh, and around Hamilton up until the time uh, we moved into a larger metropolitan area, Birmingham. Birmingham. And while I was in Birmingham, I uh, started listening to a fellow by the name of Joe Rumor, who uh -huh. was my first influence in radio. Uh -huh. I uh, had an opportunity to meet Mr. Rumor, and uh, um, he was just one of those fellow broadcasters that his morals were such you couldn't help but look up to him. He was a family man, uh, he was very successful, but he always had time to talk to you. Mm -hmm. And that impressed me very deeply at the time. Mm -hmm. Did you have siblings that grew up with you? My sister, uh -huh. uh, my, my sister's four years younger, uh -huh. but never had any real interest in uh, broadcasting. Okay. Um, she and I used to sing together uh -huh. and uh, she could never understand why I got the lead and she had to do the do whack do <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a career before broadcasting? As a matter of fact, I did. I went into music. And Norma, when I was in high school, everybody was talking about, well, they wanted to go to this college or that college. I had absolutely no interest in that. I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to go on the road as a musician, as a singer, uh -huh. and I was afforded that opportunity with a group called the Four Flickers, uh -huh. and they were a, a, a four-man group. We were actually uh, contracted to Mercury Records, and uh, we traveled all over the United States for two and a half years. Uh, from the time I was 18 until I was just over 20 years old, uh -huh. and um, saw 45 of the, of the Continental 48 while wow. I was with them. Uh, it was a great life for a young man, uh, unattached and uh -huh. uh, out to see the world. <laughs> and it gave me a musical knowledge that uh, spanned everything from rock and roll up to uh, a great jazz artists mm -hmm. like, uh, well, the Stan Kenton Orchestra mm -hmm. and, and people like that. We, as a group, uh, specialized in four freshman style harmony. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found that intriguing as well. But uh, one of the reasons I came to, well, uh, came back to Great Falls after we played here was at that time there were more genres of music available in Great Falls, Montana than any other locale I'd been in. Wow. Yeah. Huh. And I came back with the idea that I would be here for, uh, oh, two or three months at most. And at the first snowflake, I would be taillights uh -huh. uh -huh. <laughs> heading back south. But then I met a girl. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you sang bass in the yes. group? Yes, and I did. And did you play your guitar as well at that uh, time? At the time, I didn't. Uh -huh. I, I, I was playing trombone. Uh -huh. But in uh, 1973, uh, Tommy Grisesky, pardon me, 1963, uh -huh. I get ahead of myself. 1963, Tommy Grisesky called me and said, Dave, I want you to put together a group for me and be my house band. And I had a great keyboardist, uh, I had a great drummer, I found a great guitarist that I imported from Davenport, Iowa, but I didn't have a bass player. Uh -huh. And the fellow who played keyboard was a good friend of mine, and he said, well, Dave, you play guitar. He said, you know, the first four strings on the bass, are, uh, I mean, that's like the first mm -hmm. four strings mm -hmm. on the guitar. Mm -hmm. So uh, I started playing bass then, and... Uh, 
gradually that took over from where the trombone came in because it was more opportunity. Okay. So then from that you started to get into broadcasting and how did that happen? Uh, I w was uh, working at uh, one of the local clubs here in town uh -huh. and one of the DJs from KUDI radio followed the name of, of James Leppard came in. He was on the air as the uh, mighty James Francis Patrick Cody Owens or <laughs> the incomparable as he said JCO. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well he would come in and uh, one night, he and I were chatting, and he said, what in the world do you do during the day? And I said, absolutely nothing. I said, I'm bored to death. And he said, well, you know, our radio station is looking for a part-time salesman. I said, to sell what? He said, advertising. I said, well, I think I can do that. So I went in and talked with uh, um, the uh, powers that be there, and uh, they said, well, if you can go out and sell an account, you can uh, you, you can have the job. Mm -hmm. Well, I went over and Dick Daniels had the car wash over on the west <laughs> side, right behind uh, um, the local restaurant there. Mm -hmm. And I went in and told him, I said, Dick, you've got some empty bays here. He said, well, yeah. And I said, well, you know, you couldn't uh, really afford to have too many hours like that. Why don't you let me fill those up for you? And he said, well, how are you going to do that? And I said, with radio advertising. He said, oh, really? I said, yeah, I got the perfect station. All the young kids listen to us. They're the ones who wash their cars, keep them clean. So uh, I sold him a plot of spots, went back to the station. And uh, that actually, uh, uh, well, it grew into letting me write my own copy and then letting me read my own copy. Uh -huh. And uh, eventually uh, I thought, well, you know this is kind of fun. I think I'd like to go on air. And I talked to uh, JCO about that. He said, well, David, with your voice, you really ought to be on a country station. And I had met Al Donahue some years before. Yeah, so uh, I went up to KMON and mm -hmm. told Al, I said, uh, Al, I think I want to be a DJ. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, do you have any experience? And I said, no, but I'm willing to learn. And he said, well, um, <laughs> tell you what, come on in, we'll give you a try. Yeah, but I want you to come in and train for a couple of mornings. So I did with Brian Keats. And uh, the third morning I was there, Brian came out of the uh, 6 o'clock news and got into his first record. And he said, I forgot to make coffee. And he jumped up and left the room. He said, you've got it. Oh, oh my goodness. Uh, so, <laughs> I went over, and I'll never forget, I introduced uh, Bonnie Guitar singing Dark Moon. That's the first <laughs> record I ever introduced on air. Oh, how funny. But uh, uh, I went ahead then, and uh, uh, they said that as soon as they had a part-time thing come open, they would call me. Well, on uh, St. Patrick's Day of 1969, uh, I got a call from Jim Johnson, who was the program director, and he said he and Dale Devish were going to go out and celebrate that night, St. Patty's Day, both being good Irishmen. And uh, he'd like me to come in and work the six to midnight shift for Dale. Well, I went in, and that first hour, of course, I mean, man, you're scared to death, but uh, the first thing I know, the phone starts ringing. And it's the guys from Howard's Pizza downtown. And I picked it up, and he said, hey, he said, uh, we're sitting down here listening to you. You got any Marty Robbins songs? I said, oh, you bet. And played that. Well, then they called back and requested something else. And then some other folks started calling in. So uh, before the night was over, I was, listen, I was cemented into that chair. Man, that's <laughs> where I'm supposed to be, and I knew it. Well, uh, Alan after a couple of months told me, he said, David, you'll get a full cl uh, first class license. I'll put you to work full time. Mm -hmm. And I went ahead and studied diligently and uh, under the auspices of uh, uh, Albert Plugin, who was our chief engineer at the time. Then I went out to uh, Portland, Oregon, took my test and passed that mm -hmm. and came back and went to work for Al full time mm -hmm. January 2nd, 1970. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, the day I started, Howard Trevatton, the sales manager, came to me and he said, hey, you've sold. I said, yeah. He said, you want to sell some more? I said, sure. 
He said, okay. And what I didn't realize, Norma, was it put me in a unique position of being a salesperson and an on-air talent. Mm -hmm. And uh, just, I mean, that to me was wonderful because I could sure. come in, do my shift, mm -hmm. but I wasn't closed in by four walls all day. I could still get up and uh, mm -hmm. roam around the neighborhood, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, see what was going on. And I, I, I relished that. I really yeah. did. And then, of course, uh, so many things I wanted to do. Uh, Al Donahue, and thank goodness for Al Donahue. Uh, I would go in and say, Mr. Donahue, here's what I want to do. And he'd say, well, why? Mm -hmm. And don't tell me just because you want to. Uh -huh. And i tell you what, you better have your guns loaded when you walked in there. But if you could do that, then he would give you the go ahead. Well, uh, one day I went to him and I told him, I said, uh, you know, Nashville is coming up with all this remade rock. If we're going to play rock and roll, let's play the good stuff, you know, the original artists and all that. Um, if we're going to be a country station, then let's be country. And uh, he said, well, talk to Reese Berryman about it, Reese Morgan. So I did, and I kept talking to Reese about it. And finally, one day, Reese said, look, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to take an hour on Saturday morning. I want you to give it a name and promo it for two weeks and then get in there and do whatever it is you're talking about doing, but get off my back. <laughs> well, he and I came up with the name of Grassroots Gold. Grassroots Gold. And that's how that launched. And, and that's and been on how many years now? That's been on now for uh, 43 years. Oh. And it's still going strong. Yeah. And Al introduced me to a fellow by the name of Pete Logan. Mm -hmm. Pete was a world-renowned radio announcer. He or uh, rodeo, yes, rodeo mm -hmm. announcer. Mm -hmm. He'd also done radio, but he had been Gene Autry's personal rodeo announcer for eleven years. Was the only man to have ever worked Madison Square Garden by himself. No statistician, no nothing. Pete kept it all right here, and uh, he just uh, well, he was describing the first time he'd heard a particular song to me. And uh, it put a picture in my mind. Mm -hmm. And I told him, I said, that was good. Let me try that with you. And I did. I said, let me take you for a minute way down south. And it's late afternoon. Sun has gone down. And that first little breeze of the evening is starting to come up. But as those last rays filter through the pine trees and turn them black, way in the distance, you can hear that lonesome wail of a freight train. And you realize with the darkness coming on, you're in the pines, in the pines where the sun never shines, and you shiver when that cold wind blows. He said, I can see it. Well. Pete, or uh, Al, came, Al Donahue came out and said, hey, we got to get you on a plane. He says, Wilson, I'll be back. And uh, sure enough, <laughs> he did come back, and we wound up being partners. And, uh, yeah, he was just great. Oh, I'll yeah. tell you what, uh, he, ta he taught me so much about, mm -hmm. uh, about, radio, about life, for that matter. Mm -hmm. He was just like a second father to me. Mm -hmm. Well, in, um, in, in 1986, uh, he actually went through a, um, a stroke, very debilitating, and uh, he told me, he said, I, I just can't do the show anymore. But he said, you've been working with Jim Lynn in the band. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jim and I had put together uh, basically a show group. Mm -hmm. And uh, we took that over to uh, Denmark and Sweden mm -hmm. and Germany, and uh, uh, very successful with that over there. But uh, Jim and I had, had a chemistry together on stage, I guess. And so he became the new co-host with me, and he and I are still doing still our thing today strong. with Grassroots Gold. Absolutely. But through your broadcast career, you have had the privilege, and through the um, Country Western Station, you've gotten to interview some of the great, great names oh, in country you. music. And, and I know that you would like to share <laughs> probably the most memorable one that was early on in your career. Yes, it was. Ray Price. Right. 
I had a call from uh, from uh, the, the fair manager at the time, Bill Giazza, uh -huh. and he said, David, would you like to interview Ray Price? I said, certainly. Mm -hmm. He said, well, I'm going to send him up, but he said, let me tell you something. You handle him with kid gloves or he'll get up and walk out on you. Now, listen, this is my very first major country music. I mean, I'm scared to death. Well, I'm walking around the station there, you know, and these two cowboys walked in it during the noon hour. And one hadn't shaved and got his hair down his face. And I said, can I help you guys? And the one looked up and said, well, yeah, I'm Ray Price. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> so we bring him back to the studio and we start in, you know, and thank goodness, Norma, we were recording this. If I, this had happened to me on air, I don't know what I'd have done. But <laughs> we're going along and I have gotten comfortable, you know, with the interview. I thought, boy, you're doing good. You're really doing good. And all of a sudden, it hit me who I was talking to. <laughs> and I just stopped. And my, I know my eyes were like this. And Ray Price looked at me and he said, David, what's wrong? <laughs> I said, good God, man, do you know who you are? <laughs> you're Ray Price. <laughs> he what said, did he say? He said, David, I'm the very same guy you started the interview with. Back that tape up and let's do it again. Aww. And he was so gracious to me. Well, uh, about three years ago, he was back in Great Falls, and I had a chance to take him a picture that we had done together. <laughs> and uh, he autographed that to me, and we both agreed that we were a lot younger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, and how about the, the next lady you wanted to talk this about? This lady I, I met. Uh, and she did more for opening the portals of Nashville to me. Mm -hmm. Her name is May Boren Axton. Uh, she was the co-writer of Elvis Presley's Heartbreak Hotel. Oh, wow. She was the mother of Hoyt Axton. Okay. And Senator David Axton from Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And uh, she uh, decided she would help me. And she did, I mean, she opened so many doors for me. Well, that like the night... Uh, I flew down to Nashville, mm -hmm. and uh, they were doing a toast for her. And she called me and said, I want, you, I want you to come down for this. And I said, May, there's no way the station's going to let me off, because I would, she told me all three major TV, uh, TV studios were going to be there, ABC, CBS, you know, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, they'll have the interview right sewed up. I, and she said, what are you going to wear that night? And I said, well, I just bought a new silver gray tuxedo. And she said, I'll call you right back. And about 10 minutes later, she called me back and she says, I just talked to Willie and Waylon and Reba and everybody else. <laughs> and they can't wait to talk to my friend from Montana. So what she would do is when the lights went on as the stars were coming in, she would come stand by me. And when the stars came over, naturally they would stop to say hello to her. And she would say, by the way, this is a friend of mine from Montana who would like to have a few words with you. This is Dave Wilson. Kaboom. Wow. So I got interviews with all of them and uh, some one, really notable people like Willie that. Willie Nelson. My gosh. That's yeah. before he had his braids. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How He was pretty young there. Yes, he actually yeah. was. Yeah. And uh, then through... Um, I had met Bill Raines, uh -huh. an, uh, an artist from right here in Montana, uh -huh. artist and sculptor, and Bill was also a good friend of May's, and uh, the Elvis Presley Foundation contacted Bill and actually commissioned him to do a three-figure bronze of Elvis. Well, Bill agreed to do that, but then he called me and he said, David, I want you to do the musical presentation for this and uh, gave me some parameters, and uh, we wound up doing that. Well, the great thing about it was they unveiled it at Graceland, mm -hmm. and uh, they had about 400 notables in the audience, people like Willie and Waylon and all the rest of them, but for once, <coughs> <coughs> they're listening to me oh. rather than me listening to them. Oh, that's great, and there's the statue. <laughs> Wow. <coughs> Pardon me. That's beautiful. Yeah. And then you've done a lot of work because of your beautiful voice as an MC. Um, 
And one of your traditional roles was emceeing our former bluegrass on the bay. I enjoyed that so I much. I know, and we have a great picture of you at, at well, the microphone there. Well, this one there. is, the, you know something? That's <laughs> the best publicity photo that's ever been taken of me, and oh. you took it. Well, it is a darling picture of you. That's great. With your <laughs> mouth open, <laughs> smiling. Yeah, that's great. You <laughs> bet. Oh, boy. So how many total stations have you worked for? Right now, let's see, there was, uh, well, KUDI, KMON, mm -hmm. um, for about a four-day period in 1974, pardon me, 73, mm -hmm. I went back to Memphis, Tennessee because my folks were getting older and I said mm -hmm. I should be the dutiful son, mm -hmm. go home and be close to my folks. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely lucked out, got a job on WMC, which is a station I'd wanted to work for forever because they were actually country before WSM in Nashville. Mm -hmm. And I wound up landing the midday slot there. And I went in there and worked that for four days and fought all those people and mm -hmm. didn't see blue sky. And <laughs> first thing you know, I walked in the morning of the fifth day and I said, you know, I sure hope that new old boy isn't gonna have too much trouble. And they said, what new old boy is that? And I said, whoever it is, you've got coming to replace me because I quit. Oh. <laughs> I'm going back to Montana. Oh. And I came back out, and uh, I wound up going to, uh, to uh, Keen Radio for a little bit, and then over to uh, KGVO in Missoula. Mm -hmm. But Al Donahue always was there and uh, saying, hey, come on back home. Mm -hmm. And I went back uh, with Al and... Uh, yeah, just, uh, just, I don't know, it, that, that was the, the one that I was most comfortable with. Mm -hmm. I was with Kim, I went on and on for uh, a little over 35 years. Yeah, I know it. And it was basically country, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah always. Country. Yeah. And, and, and the country stations still are prominent today, are they not? Oh, my goodness, yeah. yeah. The fact is, right now, they're saying that they're taking over uh, even, uh, they, they have more audience than even the pop field. Oh. So, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. I guess that's... Uh, that's what they want. I, I really have a problem uh, uh, with some of the things they've done. But then, uh, who was it that said, the almighty dollar will come out the winner every time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Do you watch the country music award shows? I, I do and I don't. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'll, I'll tune into it for a little bit, but... Uh, it's so much different than what I consider country music to be today that uh, I generally lose interest in it. And uh, then I'll say, well, you know, you really should be watching this, and I'll go back to it. But mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, it doesn't really hold my interest for very long, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you've seen a lot of changes in broadcasting since you first came in. And how have you adapted to the changes with all the computerization? And the pre-programming of, of well, the Well, you stations. know, you look at the way that we, we used, that we used to do things, Nora. Um, at KMON, I can recall, I had a reel-to-reel -reel right here. I had the, uh, I had another reel-to-reel -to, -reel to my right. I had two turntables here, one turntable here, a cassette player that you hardly ever used, and uh, a triple stack cart deck here. And I had a sponsor one morning. Uh, Del Pasha from Western Ranch, he said, I want to come in and watch your work. I said, come on in. And after about 20 minutes, he got up, I said, and he said, well, I'll see you. I said, where are you going? He said, man, this is the most controlled bedlam I ever saw in my life. He <laughs> said, you make me nervous. Uh -huh. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, you know, the first thing that we saw go away were uh, uh, the reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders. Mm -hmm. And uh, the cassette kind of replaced those. And then those went by the wayside, and everything was done off carts. And then the carts went away, and the computers came in. And after the computers came in, then the first thing you know, the turntables disappeared. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget the day I was told, I don't want a piece of vinyl left in this station. Take it all out. Huh. And I, I mean... But, I, you know, the hardest thing I ever did was I was, for a while, the only live DJ on KMON. Mm. 
And uh, the hardest thing I think I ever did in broadcasting was to get up out of that chair with the computer running, turn off the lights in the control room and leave. Mm. Uh, that's the day I almost didn't go back. Mm, okay. that, that that still brings a tear to my eye. Oh yeah, you know. Sure. Well, you know, with so many changes and and the fact that you were able to live through the great era of oh. broadcasting, and I'm sure we both agree there. So, what kind of advice do you have today if a, if a young person is listening to you, hearing what you're having to say, if they're interested in getting into broadcasting, because it's entirely different now. Oh, entirely different. So what but would you have to say to a person? It's exciting. Mm -hmm. It's an exciting lifestyle. And, uh, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if, if you love the music, if you love the copywriting, if you love coming up with new ideas, if you like the day-to-day -day challenge of, of going to... Uh, some employment that's never the same. Mm -hmm. Something's always different there. Um, plus the fact, uh, I think it would be like I told a police officer one day. I said, you know, I could never figure out why you guys do this. And it finally, after I went out and rode with him one night, I said, I, now I know why. You do it for the same reason I do radio. It's the adrenaline rush. Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know of anything that makes you uh, warmer inside, it just gives you more of a feeling of self-satisfaction than a career in broadcasting. My son just wound up uh, a very successful 25-year, uh, uh, well, it's, it's ongoing, uh, <laughs> but uh, two days ago, uh, they were awarded the keys to the city there in Billings. Uh -huh. um, you know, big celebration, and uh, Mark and Paul, the morning, and like Mark said, when he first went to Billings, he had an 84 Camaro with 300,000 miles on it and had no idea why he was there. <laughs> but, the, you know, th th those things come together, and you find your niche in that, mm -hmm. and as long as you've got that burning desire, mm -hmm. you bet. <laughs> you know, one question I just have to ask you, since you came from the South, mm -hmm. I have never noted a Southern accent in you. I worked hard to lose that. You did? Yeah, that, and I, had, I haven't lost all of it. I really haven't lost all of it. Um, but the, uh, the, the vocal group that I was with, the Four, uh, the four Flickers, uh -huh. um, th there was a fine they instituted on me. If I said y'all or uh, use some other southern colloquialism, uh, then I had to pay the fine. Uh -huh. So I w was very, very careful about <laughs> yeah. what I said and yeah. what I did. Right. Now, if I get on the phone to my sister, uh -huh. I'll guarantee you uh, for at least half an hour after I get off, you can't understand a word I say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how funny, how funny. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so has there been anything you've done to develop your voice? Because you really have a great resonance in your voice. You know, I, as I told you, I, I started out uh, as that bass singer, and I think that had a lot to do with it. I uh, had a lot of tips over the years uh, from people that I went to and said, how, how do you sound like you sound? Uh -huh. But I think the definitive answer was finally given me by Pete Logan. Uh -huh. Because I asked him one day, Pete had this wondrous boy. I mean, he had that Western voice just, I mean, it, he'd done work for Disney and everybody. And I said, how did you develop that? And he said, David, what you do is this. Get off of yourself, sit and actually think about what you want to sound like, and then sound like it. <laughs> I said, really? He said, yeah, at first it'll be a studied naturalness but it will become you. Oh. And he was absolutely correct. Well, you have become you. And we thank you, Dave Wilson, for being a part of this legacy project. Thank well, you thank very you much. thank you so much, Norma. I and, really enjoyed it. And thank you, everyone. And this is Norma Ashby reporting. This programming series is brought to you by the Greater Montana Foundation, benefiting the people of Montana through communication of issues, trends, and values of importance for present and future generations of Montanans. And by the Montana Historical Society, Big Sky, Big Land, Big History. And with the help of Cordillera Communications, with stations in Billings, Bozeman, Butte, Great Falls, Missoula, Kalispell, and Helena. Cordillera Communications, 
the Montana Television Network.